So today I'm going to talk a little bit about addictions to things that we can't live without. How many of you have ever been to a party and you walk in and everybody is sitting around on their phone? And you kind of go, wow, this is an exciting party. And everybody's just glued to their phones. And you kind of go, okay, what happened here? Like, are we visiting with each other or what's going on? You know, there's lots of communication going on. It's just not with the people right there. It's with people somewhere else in the world. And this has become increasingly common. Actually, one time Shelly and I were out on a date and we saw another couple sitting at another table on a date, both of them on their phones <laughs> as they were sitting there. And I don't know if they were texting each other across the table or who they were texting, but it, yeah, you know, th this is something that is more and more common in our culture. And it's kind of like, whoa, you know, I, it's like people can't let go of their phone. It's you know, they, you're just glued to it. And, and you know, as much as we can laugh about it and, you know, kind of wag our heads a little bit, the truth is there's addiction issues there for a lot of people. And it's one of those socially acceptable addictions, but it, it, it is an addiction. Uh, I'm going to read a quote here from Gerald May, and I've, I've quoted him before. He says, During the early stages of the development of addiction, the conscious mind studiously ignores or rejects any signs of increasing addictive behaviors. Not only does the person not recognize that a problem exists, she doesn't want to think about it. She doesn't see any reason even to consider it. This is denial. Evidence for addiction may be perfectly obvious to other people, but it is as if the addicted person is completely blind to it or always looking in another direction. As evidence mounts, however, the addicted person must use increasing psychological energy to keep the truth out of his awareness. This is the beginning of re repression. Somewhere deep inside, the person now recognizes that addiction exists, but he keeps the knowledge unconscious. Not only does this take considerable energy, it also means the person cannot be comfortable with, it, with himself. He must always keep his mind either occupied or dulled so that no clear space opens within with which the conscious realization might occur. Moments of peaceful openness and self-reflection, which may have seemed so pleasant in the past, are now actively avoided. Prayer, meditation, and simple times of quiet relaxation are either discontinued or filled with activities that will occupy attention. Hmm. Man, oh man. You read something like that and you go, whoa. That really kind of hits close to home. Well, let's just talk about what God might have to think about some of these things. So I want to go to Luke. Luke chapter 19. Now, you got to understand, Luke is a historian. So he is documenting the things that he learned about Jesus. And he's not one of Jesus' actual disciples, he just gathered information from the disciples in a very, very meticulous way. He was a very, very uh, uh, well-educated, kind of factually oriented person. And he, he put this together in a book we call the Gospel of Luke. And it's the third book of the New Testament, Matthew, then Mark, and then Luke. And the reason why we go to the Bible to study these things is because this is the most reliable ancient document of any kind, religious or not, 
that has stood the test of time for over 2,000 years. There's lots of theories that have come and gone, lots of scientific ideas that have come and gone, but this book has stood the test of time. People by the millions have lived their lives around the principles of this book and they have lived well as a result. And so there's some profound credibility with the Bible, which is why we want to go there as our textbook this morning. So, this is the story that Luke tells us. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he'd become very rich. He try, tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd, and so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Now Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. So let's just decode this for a minute. Zacchaeus is a Jewish man. The Jewish nation of Israel at that time was occupied by the Romans. They, the Roman Empire had spread to this part of the world, and so they had basically soldiers in Israel that were controlling the country. And part of what the Romans did during their time in the Roman Empire was they would tax whatever nations they were occupying. So the Jewish nation was being taxed by Roman, the Romans. And so they would collect a certain head tax for every individual uh, once a year. And not a lot has changed, has it? Except now our own governments collect taxes from us instead of the occupying governments. But we still are paying taxes. Now, it wasn't a progressive system, not a percentage system like we have, where the rich pay more and the poor pay less. The Romans just had a straight across tax that they charged everybody once a year. And what the Romans would do is they would hire local people, part of whatever nation they, they were in, to do the collecting of these taxes for them. They would know who was there, they would know the population, and so they would better be able to keep track of who had paid their taxes and who didn't. And often, the way it worked was that the Romans, instead of actually paying these tax collectors a wage, they would give them a commission. So the more taxes they collected, the more money they made. Sometimes I wonder if the CRA works that way too, but uh, <laughs> that's another story. Anyway, um, and they didn't monitor how much they were collecting. So they basically just trusted the tax collectors to add on their own commission to the, the flat rate tax that every person had to pay. The problem was a lot of times the tax collectors were very crooked. And you think about it, here you are working for a foreign government who's oppressing your own people and you are part of their machinery to, to oppress 
the people. So you were a traitor, really, in a sense. And so they, these, these tax collectors would just add on whatever they felt like for a commission. So sometimes they would double the amount, sometimes triple the amount, and they were literally hated for doing this by their people, for being traitors and for being crooks. And so this is who Zacchaeus was. So he obviously had decided that money was more important to solve whatever inner sense of angst he had than friendship and loyalty and respect was. He'd lost people's respect by the very fact that he'd taken this job. Now, we don't know why he took the job. Maybe his, he couldn't find any other job. Maybe he had a family that was starving and this was the only thing available to him. We don't know that. But in any case, he had chosen a job that left him very despised by everybody around him. But he was convinced that money could somehow make up for that. So I submit to you that may have been an addiction for him because that's exactly how addictions work. Addictions are a decision, subconscious most of the time, to choose one thing that will make up for the damage that it does to other areas of your life. So for example, we might choose to do this when we're with other people because somehow we think this will make us feel better than actually connecting face to face with people. And so we, we choose to allow this relationship, this face to face relationship to get damaged while we do connecting electronically with other people. And that's exactly what an addiction is. We're choosing one thing to fill our in, inner void in exchange for damaging other things in our lives. And that's what Zacchaeus had did. And, and so, it, the interesting thing here is that money is something that Zacchaeus couldn't live without. It's something none of us can live without. Now, we might try, but I hate to break it to you, you got to have some money to survive. And so, he was addicted to something that he couldn't live without. And there's all kinds of addictions like that. that you can live without a phone. I'm not sure you can live reasonably well in our culture without a phone of some kind. But there's other addictions as well, you know, like exercise. You need some form of exercise, but an exercise can become an addiction as well. Maybe you know somebody like that, and they cannot go through a day without doing some exercise of some kind. It's an obsession for them. Food is another thing. You know, you can live without food for a few days, but we all need food for survival. And yet, food and eating can become an addiction. And you maybe know people like that who are obsessed with food. And they just, you know, they, they, it's almost like they, they can't walk by the fridge. Don't put up your hand if you're one of those. But that's, that, you know, that's one of those things that can be like that. Another addiction can be just sunshine. We all need sunshine, but some people are obsessed with sunshine. You know, they just, you know, they got to go to a tanning booth or whatever, and as soon as the sun is out, they've got to be out in the sun and so on and so forth. And it, so, I mean, almost anything can become an addiction. Now, the reason why usually something becomes an addiction is because like we read this quote from Gerald May, it, we're, we're hiding from something. We're hiding, like a screen addiction, for example. You're often hiding from real face-to-face -face interactions with people. 
There's maybe something painful for you from your past or something about those interactions. Maybe you've been hurt deeply by somebody that you really trusted and so you, you hide behind a screen. Or maybe there's something you don't want to do and so you get yourself really busy on, online so you can avoid doing that thing. Procrastination, it's called, in other words. Or it can be just boredom. Maybe it's a way to hide from the fact that you're bored, or so on and so forth. I mean, there can be all kinds of things that we are trying to mask with our addictions. I think one of the most common things that in our culture here in Whitecourt is gaming, actually. People glued to the gaming screens as a way to hide from the rest of their lives and the painful parts of the rest of their lives. And, and you've probably known people as well as I have whose life has basically almost been taken over by gaming of different forms. Let me read you a uh, quote from a doctor named uh, Norman Dodge. Video games like internet porn meet all the conditions for the plastic brain map changes. That's a technical term for when your brain begins to rewire itself. A team at the Hammersmith Hospital in London designed a typical video game in which a tank commander shoots the enemy and dodges enemy fire. The experiment showed that dopamine, remember we mentioned dopamine uh, as the main uh, chemical in the brain that is, is part of addictions. The reward neurotransmitter, also triggered by addictive drugs, is released in the brain during these games. People who are addicted to computer games show all the signs of other addictions, cravings when they stop, neglect of other activities, euphoria when on the computer, and a tendency to deny or minimize their actual involvement. The really sad thing about addictions in general, including addictions to technology, is that when you, your brain is in overproduction of dopamine, it actually slows down its development, especially in children and teens. And so you, you actually are putting the brakes on at, to normal brain development in your child and your teenager when they are engaging in an addictive behavior of any kind. But the most common one in our culture is often screens of some kind, gaming or, or uh, just being on, on YouTube or something like that. It is actually damaging to the brain. And, and researchers believe this may be one of the reasons why uh, adult um, behaviors are, are delayed somewhat in um, young adults now compared to previous generations. So you have people way into their 20s who are still acting like teenagers because their brain development has actually been slowed down as a result of excess screen time. It's really actually a very sad situation. So let's get back to our story here. Jesus sees Zacchaeus and he actually zeroes in on him and invites himself over for, for dinner. Don't you love people that do that? Just say, hey, I'm coming over to your place today. Uh, what are we having? Well, that's what Jesus did for Zach. And Zacchaeus, he, he goes, yeah. So obviously he, he was up for it. And he, he has Jesus over. And the interesting thing is that Jesus basically comes to his house. And I don't know what Jesus said. The story doesn't tell us that. But Zacchaeus starts to respond to Jesus in a very unique way. So we've already determined that Zacchaeus was probably addicted to money. 
And all of a sudden, Zacchaeus is saying, I'm going to start giving my money away. So there's a freedom that's starting to come to him from this addiction. And he's starting to, to say, you know what, I don't need money anymore. I don't need more and more and more of this. I'm actually going to start giving away. And then he makes the statement, you know, if I've cheated anybody, as if, his whole life has revolved around cheating people, he says, I'm going to give back four times as much. And so there's this major turnaround in Zacchaeus. And so he starts giving back what he has literally stolen from people. And Jesus responds by saying, salvation has come to this house today. Did Zacchaeus ever struggle again with that addiction? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Often, when people come out of an addiction, it's a bit of a crooked road. There's two steps forward, one step back. Often, that's very, very common. And, uh, you know, there's... The truth is, it's easier actually to break an addiction to something that you don't need to have in your life at all than it is to, to rein in an addiction for something you need to have some of. For example, food, you know, we all need to eat. So you can't just say, well, I'm addicted to food, so I'm going to just stop eating. It doesn't work that way. It's same thing with exercise. Oh, I'm addicted to exercise, so I'm just going to stop exercising. Wouldn't that be nice? Or, you know, I'm addicted to this or that. You know, I'm addicted to money, so I'm just going to stop having money. You couldn't, can't do that. You've got to have some money. So somewhere along the way, Zacchaeus learned how to moderate this area in his life. And this is what Jesus is saying here. And... The truth is that what Zacchaeus was really looking for, but probably didn't realize it, was acceptance and love. And maybe he thought he could sort of buy that with money somehow, but it, it wasn't really working for him, obviously. And so Jesus loves him, and that power of that love and acceptance actually transforms Zacchaeus. It's interesting that Jesus didn't go after Zacchaeus for his addiction. You don't see Jesus wagging his finger at Zacchaeus going, You brat! What do you think you're doing? Idiot! Come on! Stop it! We don't see Jesus doing that. Jesus goes deeper than that. He looks at the underlying issue that's causing the addiction, addresses that, and the addiction starts to take care of itself in a sense now the problem with most addictions is that they work see the truth is that if you're addicted to money often the reason you're addicted to money is because you need the admiration of people and you see money being something that will draw the admiration of, of people because you're wealthy well Let's face it, that's true. People do admire people that are wealthy. And so there's a sense in which that's the thing that gets you. In the short term, the thing that you're addicted to actually gives you a form of what you are looking for. The problem is that in the long term, it actually makes it worse. See, you can sort of numb the pain in your soul initially and that feels good enough to, to actually confuse you into thinking that you are going to be okay. And this is why addictions take hold because it feels good for the moment. So if I can just keep doing this, giving myself temporary relief from whatever I'm struggling with, you can fool yourself into thinking, I'll be okay. And maybe that's exactly what Zach had done. You actually will feel better for a little bit. But in the long term, you're just setting yourself up for a bigger and bigger disaster. Like Zach was getting rejected by more and more and more people. 
And that was obviously causing more and more pain for him. And so when Jesus starts to help us gain freedom, he doesn't just give us a temporary sort of shot in the arm kind of solution like an addiction does. He actually heals the underlying issues that are causing us to, to look to addictions for relief. Bottom line is Jesus won't, won't kind of cover your pain. He wants to heal your pain. Now, see, if you only focus on stopping the addictive behavior, you're actually kind of missing the point. And that's sort of the main point of this story. Jesus had just gone after Zacchaeus for his love of money or his addiction to money, he would have missed the point. Zacchaeus may have been able to change a little bit or he may have even been able to divert into a different kind of addiction to cover for his loneliness. But he wouldn't have solved anything long term. Now sometimes you have to start by dealing with the addiction because the addiction can become so powerful in our lives that the only way to actually feel what's going on inside is to stop the addiction first. And often that's what they say to see people who are in addiction. That first thing you need to do is stop the addiction. Then you need to look deeper inside at what's going on there. And, and that's very important. Here's another quote from Gerald May. Sadly, the brain never completely forgets what it has learned. Because of the deep and pervasive physical power of strong attachments, their potential exists forever in us, even after we have effectively broken the habit of acting upon them. We may joke about never forgetting how to ride a bicycle, saying, don't worry, it will come back to you. But the permanence of addiction memory is not funny. It stands ready to come back to us with only the slightest encouragement. The brain learns how to do its attachments far better than it learns to ride a bicycle or drive a car. And it remembers them more powerfully. Years after a major addiction has been conquered, the smallest association, the tiniest taste, can fire up old cellular patterns once again. So it's interesting that just like we remember how to ride a bike or drive a car, our brain remembers how to do addictions too. And so that's why we can't afford to toy with them. We need to have that underlying healing there so that their, the craving for them goes away and we can live in that freedom. Once you, you start to press into Jesus and understand your need for him, that's when healing can truly begin to happen. I want to go to one more scripture here. And this is Paul speaking. Now Paul, he knew what it was to change his life. He had radically shifted from one direction in his life to another. And this is what he writes. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. He's talking about a weakness here. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So the only way to really tap into the power of God is to allow ourselves to admit that we are weak. And often the only way to really understand that about ourselves is to stop the addictive behavior and then you realize, whoa, this really has a lot of power in my life. And when we begin to start down that road, our weakness or our awareness of our weakness actually opens the door for us to invite the power 
of God into our hearts. See, as long as we're numbing things inside of us with addiction, we can easily fool ourselves into thinking, I've got this. I can do this. I can control this. And how many of you have heard people talk about stopping an addiction? And they'll say, oh yeah, I've stopped my addiction many times. What's that? I mean, if you haven't got the power to permanently stop the addiction, you don't really have the power over the addiction. And so this is where admitting our weakness allows us to open the door for Jesus to look at the deeper things that actually are causing the addiction. It allows us to realize we don't have it all under control. So, I remember reading this story about this corporate board. And so you've got these high-paid executives on this big multinational corporation and they were going to make a very important decision and so the CEO of the company he says I want you to come to the board meeting you know I want you to be well prepared you know read all the material do the research research and so on and we're going to sit down and make this decision about the future of our company probably one of the most important decisions from a business standpoint that we will ever make in our lifetime and then when they arrived he had his secretary standing at the door with a basket and he says because this this meeting is so important i don't want you to have any distractions so please put all your electronics in the basket so they, you know, were putting their laptops and their phones and their whatnot all in there. And they sat there around the boardroom table. <laughs> and they couldn't focus. They couldn't focus on the issue. Because they, they were, some of them were literally twitching because they, they couldn't be without their phones. And, you know, they, they were just sitting there going, oh, well, I wonder who's texting me or who's emailing me or who's, you know, well, what's going on. And their, their minds were so focused on all the stuff that they were missing out on that they literally were having a terrible time focusing on their decision at hand. Even though it was one of the most important decisions they would probably every, ever make in their career. They were just addicted literally to their electronics and so we can easily you know go about our kids these guys were in their 40s and 50s some of them in their 60s and they were having the same kind of addiction issues as what our teenagers have so i don't think any of us can wag our fingers or our tongues at anybody else when it comes to these issues. This is something that is a problem right across the whole spectrum of our culture. Here's Gerald May again. A therapist, therapist friend recently told me he had observed that addicted people can't meditate. I agreed that chemically addicted people do indeed seem to have trouble settling down and being wakefully present, but I also had to add, don't we all sometimes find it difficult to relax within ourselves? I know my own daily practice of prayer and meditation is not easy. One reason is that this practice opens my awareness to things about myself that I would rather not be conscious of. In many instances, these awarenesses have to do with my addictions. How attached I am to certain petty concerns and competitions. How I worry I am about true, how worried I am about truly insignificant things. How important my selfish ego is to me. So I find myself resisting settling down to pray or I fill my meditation time with images or music or words, anything that will keep me from simply being present and awake before God. Wow. 
sometimes the most important indicator of whether we're struggling with addiction or not is how much peace we have inside when there's nothing else going on. We're coming to the close of our service here. I want to give you a few practical steps with regards to what to do in your own life. Maybe it'll be more of an experiment for you. Maybe you're recognizing, no, I need to do this. First of all, I want to invite you, if you've never actually connected with Jesus at a personal level, so you don't have a kind of a relationship with him that's personal for you, that's critical. That's a starting point for this whole process. And if you're in that, that, that shoe, those shoes today and you've never opened your heart to Jesus, I'd like you to do that. I think that makes a massive, massive difference in every area of your life, including this one. And so, as we come to the close of the service here, I'm going to ask the prayer team to just stand over there by the cross again. And if you would like to start a relationship with Jesus, they would be happy to pray with you and show you how to do that. They've actually got some materials there too that will help you understand what you're doing. And so I'm going to ask Crystal and the team just to kind of play quietly here for a minute. And if you're in that boat, just, just make your way over there. Nobody else is going to really bat an eye. And, and then ask them if they would pray with you. Now, if that's too scary for you, you can just send me a text and I'll, I'll connect with you that way. Or the back of this card has a place to fill out about that too. And I can get back to you about that. But I think that's really, really important. Now, the second thing I'd like to, to uh, encourage you to do is to ask Jesus to show you what is it deep inside of me that I'm running from? What's causing me to just be so anxious? And then I'd like to invite you to just slow down and listen. Just slow down and listen. I think so often we are just running, running, running at such a breakneck pace within ourselves that we can't, can't really connect with God. And we can't get His help to heal those broken parts inside of us. So I'm, I'm going to ask the, the worship team just to play really quietly for a few minutes here this morning. And I'm going to invite all of us just to sit. And if you're sitting here this morning while they're playing and you start to feel anxious inside, just let that anxiety point you to Jesus. That's an indicator that you really need Him. And if, you're, if you don't feel anxious, that's great. Just let His presence saturate your soul and let, you, let Him just soak into you. But let's all have open hearts towards Him this morning and just say, Jesus, I'm just sitting here with my spiritual ears open, listening for your whisper. And if there's things you want to touch, to explain, to open my eyes to, I'm here, I'm open, I'm willing. Let's do that.